two-part talk. In the first part, I wanted to uh, somehow give uh, an overview, a review and an overview of the status of uh, uh, flow equations, of constructing flow equations, of describing black holes via first-order uh, differential equations rather than the, well, especially for the non-BTS case, uh, rather than the second-order equations that we would have generically. And the second part will be on some more recent work where we try to uh, construct these flow equations in gauge supergravity uh, together with uh, Alessandro Gnecchi. Um, so the idea of uh, uh, having first order flow equations uh, and to construct black holes by first order equations is that of uh, really studying and uh, having, constructing uh, the full solution. So many interesting details of the physics of black holes can be understood just by looking at near rising properties or global properties like uh, uh, simply the assignment of charges uh, of uh, the black hole, for instance. And just by studying, for instance, uh, uh, U-duality orbits uh, of uh, black holes, you can classify them, group them in various classes and understand uh, physical properties just by looking at which class this uh, black hole uh, is part of. Or, for instance, we know that we can understand uh, many interesting, a lot of interesting physics about black holes just by looking at horizon properties because we know, for instance, that we have this, the famous uh, relation between the entropy uh, and the area of the black hole, which doesn't really depend much on the detail of the full solution, but depends really only on the uh, behavior close to the horizon. However, there are some features which are uh, somehow beyond reach uh, if you just look at the near horizon. And uh, an important thing is, in fact, the existence actually of, uh, of full solutions. And in order to have the existence of uh, uh, solutions, and especially of interpolation, interpolating solutions, um, you really need to have a good way to construct them, an effective way like the one that we propose with the flow equations. And the idea is that, uh, at least for extremal black holes, you think of extremal black holes as uh, solutions which are interpolating really between different vacuums of the same theory. You have on the one hand, uh, for instance, uh, a Minkowski vacuum of a certain theory, and you have on the other hand another vacuum of your theory, which can be an ABS2 cross S2 vacuum, for instance, and you describe your extremal uh, black hole as a solution interpolating between the two, which, for instance, for static asymptotically flat solutions will be just a radial flow described by a one-dimensional system in the end. Now, I can give you an example, though, uh, where uh, having only the near horizon properties is not enough. So we know that, uh, I mean, generically, when we try to construct solutions in this fashion, we think of these, as I said, as interpolating solutions. So what we do is really understand and try to classify what are the possible near horizon geometries that you have in a certain theory, and assume that for each near horizon geometry, you have an interpolating solution between that near horizon geometry and some asymptotically uh, Minkowski force space, for instance. But think of the following instance. Uh, think of n equals to standard ungauged supergravity on the one hand, The standard theory that you get, for instance, from uh, uh, compatifying type two theories on a cloud uh, for which uh, we know that we have uh, both obviously a Minkowski four vacuum and a, a, ma a maximally supersymmetric ADS2 cross S2 vacuum, and you know that the black hole solution in here can be constructed as a half VPS state, and for these we have been studying them already now since uh, many, many years, and we know essentially all the physics. Uh, but however, you can think of a different theory which has exactly the same possible vacua, I mean, Koski 4 vacuum, and again, the same it is 2 cross S2 vacuum, whose interpolating solutions, however, could not be the same. And this additional theory is simply, again, n equals 2 supergravity in four dimensions, but with a U1 gauging. Now, this theory is a deformation of the original n equals 2 supergravity, uh, where you introduce some gauging parameters, some Paye Heliopoulos, constant Paye Heliopoulos, which 
gauge are you one? And uh, in this model, if you choose carefully the values of these uh, uh, of the fluxes of the parameters that uh, give you the gauging of this Faye oculus, you can obtain a theory which has a scalar potential which is identically vanishing. So effectively, the bosonic sector of that theory is perfectly identical to the bosonic sector of this other theory, even though the fermionic sectors are different. And the supersymmetry transformation rules are also different. Now, if you think of these vacua in the theories, of course, in both theories you have Minkowski 4, and in both theories you can, since the bosonic sector is the same, you can think of having an ADS2 cross S2, which, has, which is exactly the same ADS2 cross S2. However, in this case, you have a half VPS flow, which in this theory will not be supersymmetric. And in this theory, in principle, you may think of having a one-quarter BPS flow, which would not be supersymmetric in this other theory. Uh, now, of course, if you just look at the asymptotics, if you just look at the near horizon properties of these possible solutions, uh, you know whether this solution really exists. And the only way to really check whether it is there or not is to actually try to build it. And if you try to build a real solution, as I will show you later on, you can find, you will find that uh, actually this solution is, is impossible. There are constraints that tell you that most of the uh, near horizon geometries that you would assume exist for a black hole in this theory are not compatible with the gauging. Uh, but I will come back to that later on. So it's important, as I said, to have not just the uh, near horizon, to study just the near horizon properties or the asymptotic properties of black holes and things like that, but it's impossible, important also to have interpolating solutions. And the idea of uh, this talk is, well, uh, was to give, a, first of all, a, a review of the status of this first order formalism in the first part, uh, since it's now five years that we propose essentially this uh, first order formalism for non-extreme, for non-supersymmetric extreme of black hole. And it grew a lot, and you've heard also some developments in talks by Yosef uh, and Yom. And uh, it has led to many interesting developments, and I think also uh, an interesting, even though, uh, well, possibly a bit related, but uh, interesting other line of development is the application of first order formalism also to uh, non extreme black holes, which I think Tomas will uh, discuss in his talk. Uh, and the second part was to more specific on some more recent work on a trying to apply this uh, first order formalism to black holes in ADS and to show the difficulties that arise there compared to the, uh, to the case uh, uh, in the uh, ungauged theory. So now since I'm doing everything on the black hole, unfortunately I have to uh, condense a bit uh, and I will try to the, the talk and so I'll try at least to condense the first part and uh, give a bit uh, more time to the second part where the new material is. However, I want to first uh, just uh, write you a bit the ideas that are behind this first order formalism and why I think uh, uh, they are important and it can be applied also to the gauge supergravity case. Uh, now, the original idea actually to have this first order uh, formalism uh, also for non uh, supersymmetric uh, uh, extremal black holes uh, came from an observation by uh, Goldstein, Jena, Mandel, and Trivedi here where they show that for, well, not just for static, but for sure, at least, I was interested <coughs> more in the static uh, extremal, extremal non-BPS black holes, you have a C function. A C function that is given as a function of the work factor which you have in these solutions and which is monotonically decreasing from uh, uh, infinity going towards the horizon. And uh, on top of that, so you have a function that defines for you a very specific direction of the flow. And uh, you also have an attractor behavior. You know that uh, since uh, Perara Gibbons uh, Kalosh that also non BPS black holes have an attractive behavior. So even though the equations of Non supersymmetric black holes are generically second order, and then you would expect that even if you have a minimum, your solution may start oscillating around the minimum. The fact that you have this uh, C function here, which is giving you a specific direction of the flow, together with the fact that you have a real attractor, suggested the fact that maybe there was a way to describe the same solution in terms of just first order equations and not second order as they would be because they're not supersymmetric. 
So that's the idea. And in fact, uh, that combined with the fact that if you think about at least the static extreme of black holes and asymptotically flat, the uh, black hole solution is essentially described by a one-dimensional problem, which is very close to the uh, domain wall uh, solutions that you have and that we've been studying in the SCFT, uh, for which also there is a C function and for which also there is a, a first order description also in the non-BPS case uh, using uh, Costas and, uh, uh, and Townsend uh, idea and then extended by our phase to gravity, let's say. And so the idea was to try to do the same for black holes. And in fact, you can do the same. Uh, also because of another uh, simple analogy, because as I said, at least in this case, the Lagrangian the reduced Lagrangian, the problem is one dimensional, and it's very similar to a system that everybody knows, which is that of uh, instantons in quantum mechanics. So for instance, if you think about the instanton Lagrangian, I mean, for a single degree of freedom, essentially you have the kinetic term of that degree of freedom and the potential, of course, with a plus sign because you're in Euclidean space in that case. And you may supplement the equations of motion coming from this Lagrangian with a constraint telling you what is the energy of the system. And if you want an extremal solution somehow, you ask for a zero energy uh, solution, then you can see that you can rewrite the action for such a system as the square of a condition which will be the condition defining for you the instanton plus a boundary term which you can discard generically. Now, an instanton will be a solution to this equation, which at the same time satisfies the Hamiltonian constraint and the equations of motion coming from the Lagrangian. Now, if you have, if you think about the black holes, uh, then a black hole system is essentially a system which has the same, uh, the same structure, only that now you have a number of scalar fields here, where the various scalar fields are these scalar fields of your uh, supergravity Lagrangian and the work factor that you have when you consider uh, static spherical symmetric solution. You essentially have just one work factor. It will just be another degree of freedom which you have in the, in the system. And if you consider extremal solutions, you will have also an Hamiltonian constraint like that, which is needed actually because if you do the reduction to one dimension, this is not a consistent reduction. And so in order to have that solutions, to this one-dimensional Lagrangian and also solutions to the original equations of motion, you have also to introduce this Hamiltonian constraint. Now you can do the same trick, but of course, since you have a vector here now, you need to introduce a vector there. And of course, here you will have a phi prime, you will have now a dot product between phi prime and the vector times the square root of v. And the fact is that now this object will not be generically a total derivative. So in order for this to be a total derivative, this vector that you're choosing here cannot be arbitrary, but it should be the gradient of some function. Now this should be something like 1 over the square root of v times the gradient of a function of the various uh, scalars that you have in your theory and the work factor. Now, this, again, would be enough to tell you that once you have, once you look at the uh, configurations that satisfy this equation, you satisfy the equations of motion, you satisfy the Hamiltonian Lagrangian, and you forget about the boundary term. However, there is one important fact here that uh, in order to have the BPS rewriting like this, this uh, vector should be a unit vector. So in order to have this uh, as a boundary term, this should be the gradient of something, but then you also have the constraint that it should be uh, uh, a unit vector. And in order for that to be a unit vector, I mean the, the simple constraint that n is a unit vector tells you that this function f uh, whose gradient will give you n and in the end the function that will give you the gradient flow, the first order flow equations that will describe the black hole solution has to satisfy a partial differential equation which, has, which actually defines it. And This equation is nothing but the fact that the black hole potential 
should be given, well, actually, I can forget about the word factor. The word factor essentially factorizes that the black hole potential should be given as the sum of a superpotential function square plus the derivative of that superpotential function square. Now, if you have, so w is a function which is defined via this uh, uh, partial <coughs> differential equation. dbh is uh, a datum, I mean, is, is, a, is part of the data of your problem. Uh, you want to find a w which satisfies this condition, and you want to find a w which satisfies this condition, and at the same time, which has critical, whose critical points are the critical points uh, of uh, the, uh, well, sum of the critical points of of the black hole, the critical points that you're interested in, either the BPS or the non-BPS black hole, uh, non-BPS critical point. And if you have a W which satisfies this condition, then you will know that the work factor and the scalar fields will satisfy first order flow equations. Which will precisely describe the black hole solution, no matter whether it is VPS or non VPS. And the interesting thing is that this W plays the role of uh, really the substitute essentially the central charge of supersymmetric configurations in the sense that the entropy of the black hole will be given just by the evaluation of this uh, superpotential at the horizon and also the mass of the black hole will be given by the value of uh, W evaluated at infinity. So effectively, it replaces the uh, central charge. And actually, you can show that uh, one obvious solution is the central charge. When W is the absolute value of the central charge, then you have VPS configurations. But you can find many more solutions where W is not the central charge. And there has been work <laughs> by Prigiante et al. where they show that an existence, they prove an existence theorem for this W. So first of all, you know that for any non-BPS stream of configuration, you will always have a W that satisfies this condition. So that's already an important point because it tells you that uh, this will work also for non-BPS configuration. But of course, if you really want to construct a solution, you need a constructive proof. Now, at least for uh, scalar manifolds which are caused, uh, we had uh, developed a technique that allows us to construct in full generality this W and hence to provide uh, solutions. I will not go through it, it's uh, rather uh, long and uh, it needs lots of uh, specific details which have to do with the, uh, with the uh, symmetric, well, sorry, the cosmic manifolds that appear in n equals 2 supergravity, but I want to just give here an idea of how you could generate a simple solution which is not uh, BPS to the same condition that we have here because this then developed, uh, uh, this was at the base of uh, subsequent uh, developments uh, which let uh, several people extend these results which were first order for uh, single center solutions to multi-center configurations. And the idea is very simple. If you rewrite that black hole, so the black hole potential is defined actually in terms of the central charge in this fashion and in fact W equals Z is a solution to this uh, to the differential equation there the differential equation there however you can also rewrite it in terms of the charges as simply the charges contracting a specific matrix here which depends on your scalar fields which come from the reduction of the kinetic terms of uh, kinetic terms and the and the Axionic couplings of the vector fields in four dimensions. And if you look at that, you can see immediately that if you do a symplectic transformation that sends the charges to new, a new configuration such that the matrix M remains invariant, you can construct a function W. So, sorry, the function Z, which is the central charge, is defined as the symplectic product of the charges and the symplectic section. And if you do this transformation, and this S is constant, you can define simply a W by the action of this symplectic transformation on the charges and contract it then with the symplectic section. This, of course, is different from Z, 
but it defines for you a new function which has exactly the properties to define for you the black hole, a different way of defining the black hole potential and give you first order flows which will then be known BPS. Now, in general, since this matrix is scalar dependent, it is very difficult to find an S which is constant, which satisfies this condition. Actually, in most generic cases, the only matrix which will satisfy this condition will be just the identity, so you don't go very far with that. However, if you switch off the actions, for instance, or if you look at very simple models, you can find matrices S which are not simply the identity. And most of the times, they are flipping some of the, the sign of some, some of the charges. And this is suggesting that the way to go to find no BPS solutions starting from the BPS ones, which is to switch off the actions, try to find a matrix like that, so switch some of the signs of the charges, and then lead to solution including all the actions uh, to, the full, uh, to the full theory. And in fact, such a trick doesn't work only in four dimensions, it also works also in five. And one of the questions that you may ask is whether the fact that we have these first order equations is just uh, one of these phenomena that we would call supersymmetry without supersymmetry. So the fact that we have first order equations uh, for non-supersymmetric uh, solutions, but just because we are looking at the reduced theory and instead the solutions are really supersymmetric in a higher dimensional theory, for instance. So if you try to uh, lift the solutions that we construct in this way to five dimensions or to 11 dimensions, uh, you can actually see that instead some of these solutions uh, are really no supersymmetric all the way up to 11 dimensions or within n equals a. So in this fashion you can for sure describe some solutions which are uh, BPS maybe in higher dimensions and which lost their supersymmetry because of the reduction process, but you also have first order equations for genuinely known BPS solutions. Now, the fact that you can find solutions just by flipping the signs of some of these uh, solutions we used in five dimensions to construct uh, new no BPS solutions in five dimensions and then recover also the most general uh, four dimensional uh, non BPS single center solution. And it was used by Goldstein and Karl Manas, as it was already explained by uh, both Joseph and uh, by Guillaume, to construct the so called almost BPS uh, solutions. And the idea there, I will not now rewrite the full equations, which are rather long, of uh, the 11 dimensional or 5 dimensional system that you have in that case. However, you can see that uh, if you look at, uh, at the equations of, uh, of uh, well, okay, let me just rewrite part of these equations, which were also shown by Joseph and Guillaume. So you have equations for describing black holes in. Uh, 5D, which are, well, this is uh, part of the vector fields that you have, then there are conditions on the work factors that appear in the metric. Well, it's not too important, but the important thing is that uh, both the BPS and the non-BPS solutions have the same structure. So for the plus sign, you get a BPS configuration. And for the minus sign, you get the so-called almost BPS. And the sign change is essentially just flipping one of the charges in a certain sense. Of course, as long as your uh, four-dimensional base, now here we are in five dimensions, as long as the four-dimensional base is just R4, changing a sign is just a change of, of orientation. So in the end, the solution is really just supersymmetric. It's just a different way of rewriting the same equation. But when you have a space which is oriented, like a gibbons hawking space, then the two solutions are really different. And one preserves supersymmetry while the other doesn't. So uh, in this way, we could find extended solutions, uh, uh, the single center solutions to multi-center configurations in general. And uh, it is interesting that this simple trick applied to, this, uh, uh, to the multi-center case led to the, all the following developments, which have been partly described by Joseph and in part by Guillaume. Uh, in fact, first we found solutions in this fashion just by simply solving uh, these uh, equations, of course, in a specific frame, essentially in four dimensions, so for specific charges, and then generalized it to uh, the most general configuration by the usual pivot method using inequalities. Uh, and this has been uh, nicely uh, uh, further generalized by uh, Guillaume and Karmadas, where they show that uh, you can actually recover the same uh, solution in a more covariant formally. And also this led to the other work that you've seen and uh, yesterday on the interacting non-BPS and so on. 
So there's been a lot of developments by just uh, trying to describe black holes in terms of uh, uh, flow equations, uh, which I think uh, has given us a lot of insight of the uh, non-BPS uh, extremal configuration. So the natural question would be to try to do the same thing for for solutions in the case of uh, uh, gauge supergravity. Uh, now, in the context of gauge supergravity, of course, first of all, you have to specify the uh, theory when you want to find solutions. And of course, there are many different gauge supergravities where you can try to look for uh, black hole solutions and uh, to try to describe them by first of the flow. And there's been some development in, uh, of course, when you have a gauge supergravity, in general, also the hypermultiples, for instance, will start playing a role, and there's been developments in that uh, direction. But I, wanted to fo I want to focus only on the U1 gauge supergravity. N equals two in four dimensions. Because this theory is uh, somehow special in the sense that, as I said before, the bosonic sector is essentially the same bosonic sector is the same gives you the same Lagrangian that you have in the young gauge theory and the only difference is that you have a scalar potential which is defined in terms of a super potential in a fashion that is essentially the same as the n equals 1 supergravities so L now is the symplectic product of the charges defined in your gaugings and the symplectic section. And the potential is just given in the same fashion as you would write it in n equals 1 by the derivative square minus 3 times the absolute value of L squared. Now, in here, of course, you can consider both electric and magnetic charges. So you have electric gaugings and magnetic gaugings. And thanks to Bernard's recent work with his students, we actually now have also a uh, full Lagrangian for describing both electric and magnetic interaction in this theory and in general in n equals 2. And the critical points of this superpotential will give you the ADS4 vacua. Which you would like to use as a starting point to construct uh, your solutions, your black hole solutions. Now the standard law due to papers by Chamsedin and Sabra, was that you cannot build statically, static, asymptoti uh, asymptotically ADS black hole solutions with a spherical horizon, which were regular. No asymptotically for regular static solutions. However, uh, the no-go was based on a very simple assumption that uh, they were really looking at solutions, uh, black hole solutions, really in ADS, meaning that the space, the value of the cosmological constant had to be the same on the whole solution. So what they used is the fact that, uh, of course, uh, the lambda effective is given by the expectation value of your scalar potential of the gauging and they just fix the value of the scalars at a point where you have a DS4 and try to find solution there. Now obviously as we know from the ungauge case scalars will be generically attracted towards the horizon to a value which is fixed by the values of the charges in this case probably also by the values of the gaugings as we'll see uh, and hence uh, it is not that surprising that if you don't let the scalars flow, you will find solutions which are singular. Now, in fact, you can avoid this no-go by just letting the, the effective cosmological constant to change along the flow, which means you let the scalar flow. And in fact, you can construct, first of all, the flow equations. Now, the interesting thing about these solutions is that, as you can see here, you have uh, scalar potential, which is the gauging potential, which for instance can arise, you can think of these as in flux compatifications as the fluxes of your compatification, for instance. And this 
will give you some sort of attractor mechanism uh, that tells you that, well, for sure you'll have that the critical points of this potential will define for you the asymptotic ADS4 vacuum where the scalars will be fixed to a certain value. And now you have a competing uh, scalar potential, which is the black hole potential. which will also try to move the values of the scalars towards its critical point. So essentially you have a mechanism where you have two competing scalar potentials. And that's interesting because this, for instance, in flux compatibilications, is telling you that the values of the scalars which you fix by flux compatibilications will be destabilized when you have a black hole appearing in there. They will be destabilized because the effective one-dimensional potential that you have will be a combination of the gauging and the black hole potential. And the first order equations that the flow, uh, the black hole solution will satisfy, will involve both, uh, both uh, uh, superpotentials and the superpotential and the central charge. So you have somehow competing forces. You have, in this case, you don't have really an attractor mechanism like in the young gauge case. In young gauge case, you have that the scalar fields are just moduli at infinity, and then they are attracted towards the horizon to a value which is specified essentially by critical points of the black hole potential. In this case, however, you have uh, two uh, fixed points, two different fixed points. You have scalars which are, which are attracted to a certain value at infinity to a different value are at the horizon. So you have competing forces, and it's interesting to see how and when you can destabilize the vacuum. So you can construct first order, uh, first order solutions. How am I doing with time? Sorry. Just to see how to, to for writing down all the equations is, <laughs> takes a lot. Um, so the um, you can have also in this case first order flow equations. You can do the same trick as we did. Uh, before, for the BPS case, of course, it's easy. You can try to extend it to non-BPS. However, of course, the first step is just to rewrite the BPS equations as flow equations. And you can do it again with the BPS squaring trick. And what you find is that uh, you can indeed find first order equations. However, these first order equations uh, uh, will not exist for generic values of the charges of your black hole. So in particular, if you do the BPS rewriting, you pick a metric now which will have an additional word factor because we are now in uh, a space with a non-trivial cosmological constant and hence you have to compensate for the varying cosmological constant by letting different factors in front of the sphere and the uh, time direction. And you can define a superpotential, that's the first interesting thing, which is just a simple extension of the superpotential that you would have for the flat case, as you would expect, where the absolute value of the central charge is replaced now by the absolute value of the central charge shifted with the gauge in superpotential. And of course, there is the new work factor appearing in there. Then you have first order flow equations for the scalar fields as usual, which are gradient flows in terms of uh, the derivatives of the superpotential, you have a, a flow equation for your work factor u, which will depend on the superpotential, but now it will depend also on the derivative with respect to a of the superpotential. And you have a new flow equation for the new work factor, which directly depends on the superpotential. <coughs> now, the interesting thing is that if you look, uh, sorry, so I was forgetting now. Now, these uh, equations can be obtained, and again, you can show that once you solve these equations, you solve also the equations of motion, provided that you satisfy a constraint, which is the fact that the symplectic product of the gauging charges and all the black hole charges has to be, the, well, it has to be for spherical horizons minus one. If you assume that this, instead of being a spherical horizon, is flat, you would have zero there. And if you have a hyperbolic horizon, it will be plus one. 
So this is telling you that you cannot find, once you fix the gauging, once you fix the charges of your theory, uh, which lead you to the, uh, to the uh, gauge supergravity that you're studying, you cannot choose the charges of the black hole arbitrarily. So not any black hole will, be, will exist in such, in such a theory, but only black holes which have charges which satisfy this constraint. So this is, for instance, killing the solutions I was mentioning at the beginning. So you can see that uh, even in the case that you don't have any S4 at infinity, you have Minkowski, like in that case, because the theory is exactly the same. Uh, the bosonic sector is exactly the same, both in the gauge supergravity and in the ungauge supergravity. You cannot find the uh, solution. The solution is inconsistent with having a BPS, a photo BPS flow described by these flow equations because of this constraint. So the solutions are more constrained. The other interesting thing is about the attractors. You can, of course, rewrite, look at these conditions as flow equations, and again, at the horizon, you can try to, uh, to describe this, uh, the horizon of the black hole as some sort of attractor by algebraic equations, which now will be essentially uh, determined by the condition that the scalars, of course, will minimize the superpotential. But the other thing is that you need also A prime to go to zero. Because you would like this to remain to a finite value in the end, which this is, should, should just be the radius of the uh, sphere at the horizon. I mean, that's exactly the uh, factor that will give you the entropy of the, of the black hole, the area of the, of the black hole, and hence the entropy of the black hole at the horizon. Uh, so these conditions translate into attractor equations which are very similar to the ones that you have in uh, ungauged, in the ungauged case. So in the ungauged case, you have that the attractor equations are, give, are telling you that the charges of your black hole are essentially related to the values of the uh, imaginary part of the central charge contracted with the multiplying the symplectic sections. And now in the gauge case, you have to extend shifting the charges on the left hand side as you would expect with the, uh, with the uh, gauging parameters. And on the right hand side, sorry, you will extend the solution by adding, of course, the superpotential. So these are algebraic equations, which again are not independent, uh, all, all independent as it is in the ungauge case, which uh, uh, fix for you the values of the moduli. However, you also need to fix now the additional work factor. And in fact, the attractors are defined by an additional equation, which is specifying for you the value of the work factor at the horizon. And this is telling you that the work factor is just the ratio of the central charge and the superpotential. And this is essentially the radius of the sphere at the horizon. Now, just by using it, these attractor equations, now you can also understand the Nogo theorem that uh, Chamsadin and Sabra proposed. Because when the scalars are not flowing, this same equation can be rewritten in a different fashion as this symplectic product precisely of the gauging parameters and the black hole charges. And of course, you want this, in order to have a spherical horizon, you want this to be positive. However, by the constraint that we have there, this will become actually negative. And this is telling you that for uh, uh, constant scalars, you will never be able to uh, obtain a, a, a regular solution with a, a regular so solution with supersymmetry. Now, if however you allow non-trivial profiles for the scalars, you can work out the full solution. I will not now write down, of course, the details of the solution, but you can work out the full solution, which is generically dionic, uh, and uh, we did that with Alessandra. It was done also by Cacciatore and Clement, by Christoph and Andorin independently. Uh, the peculiarity, if you want, of our approach is that we did everything from the, from the beginning in a duality covariant fashion so that we could really uh, try to find these solutions for any, uh, in any symplectic frame and hence uh, uh, decide the, the gauging charges and the black hole charges, uh, decide which is the most appropriate frame for the, for the black hole and gauging charges so that we could really find uh, both the ionic, purely electric, or purely magnetic solutions. Uh, 
However, as I said, you cannot find uh, solutions that easily because of this constraint. And actually, uh, we fought hard, but it, was, uh, it seems that nobody has found additional solutions with respect to the original solutions that, we'll find, that were found in, this, in these three papers, essentially. And I talked also to the other people involved in these projects. And it seems very difficult to generate really solutions. Even, if, even though we have flow equations, which are obviously easily, easy to solve, uh, the problem is that the constraint kills most of the solutions that you would think you might try to find in, uh, uh, in ADS. Now, the next step, of course, uh, would be to try to take these solutions and generalize them. Uh, first of all, of course, to uh, no BTS, but extremal. Ah, uh, of course, this, I forgot to mention that these solutions are actually one quarter BTS, not half BTS. Uh, still, they are BTS. So you may try to extend this to uh, non-supersymmetric uh, uh, non extremal uh, configurations within ADS, but even more importantly, uh, I, I would think would be the simple extension of this to, BPA, to the BPS case, but multi-center. Now in that case, again, it seems that, uh, that solutions are much more difficult to find than, uh, than we expected and we foresee, uh, that we could foresee. And I just want to conclude by making an analogy with what happens in DS, uh, also to say why I think it is difficult to find this multi-center solution, which of course would be very important in order to uh, well, it would be very important, of course, in the context of the AXCFT correspondence. And the fact is the following. If you just, sorry. If you look at the DS case, of course you can write the both the DS and ADS black holes in a very similar fashion, no? Uh, using global coordinates. However, in DS, you can also use the cosmological coordinates. And you can see that the uh, extremal solutions in cosmological coordinates are rather easy to write down. And have the following form. So of course, the uh, one form is also, the vector is also uh, dealing with the same function omega, which has the uh, masses at, cent at I mean, the, the single, this is the single center solution. Uh, and you measure the distance from the center, not just with the R parameter, but with A times R. So if you do it in the global coordinates, you would have the usual harmonic functions, essentially, that you know. In the, uh, in the cosmological coordinates, the same solution will be written in this fashion. So you see that. Actually, the work factors describing your solution now will be time dependent, and it will be time dependent in a fashion that, such that the uh, distance from the black hole is rescaled with the same rescaling that is, uh, that is uh, inflating your uh, space slices. Now, this can be extended, and it was extended by Castor and Prussian to a multi center solution, simply replacing this factor by the different positions of the centers, of course, in uh, R3, all of them is scaled with the same free factor, which is, again, the uh, factor uh, dilating your, uh, inflating your, your uh, space. Now, <coughs> I don't know. Uh, this, I mean, the single center is just the solution that you would have in global coordinates, uh, the usual one. Just you do a change of coordinates and uh, rather integrated change of coordinates, and uh, the solution becomes this one. I never saw these uh, solutions, these multi center solutions, brought back to global coordinates. It's a messy thing, which is time dependent in general. However, and, and that's exactly my point. If you now go try to go this, to, to extend this to ADS, I mean, the first thing you may try to do is, of course, to just do some uh, analytic continuation of this. And the problem is that if you try to do that, and some people try, like Astefanese or and collaborators, Ross and collaborators, what they find is really not a black hole, 
but something which looks like, well, of course, it depends on how you analytically continue the solution, but uh, they find some uh, uh, bubbles of nothing instead of lack of solutions. Uh, and the other option would be to try to uh, mimic the solution, to try to obtain the same kind of solution in ADS by using cosmological coordinates in ADS. Um, however, once again, it doesn't work. I mean, you can also rewrite ADS in cosmological coordinates, no? It is essentially the same thing. You have minus zt squared plus a work factor here, which depends on time. However, the three-dimensional slice is not flat as it is in, in V-sitter, uh, but you have a sinh square there, and the work factor, of course, is not exponential, but it is a cosine of t. Essentially, it's a universe that uh, is cyclic. Of course, it's regular uh, because the sitter, until the sitter doesn't have uh, doesn't have uh, singular points. Uh, however, of course, if you start adding matter, you may think that uh, these regular solutions will not be regular anymore at some point because when the universe uh, uh, shrinks to a point, then the matter will somehow collapse, probably, probably producing a singularity. But however, you may try to find a solution in this uh, framework, just like it was done by, by Castle and Trash in the Dissiter case. What is not working is the fact that, again, uh, in this instance, uh, the uh, three-dimensional space slices are not flat on the contrary of what happens here. And essentially, you can now replace the uh, harmonic functions, at least at uh, uh, fixed time that you had there, by harmonic functions in this case. And so you cannot extend the single center solution to a multi-center solution easily. And it's interesting because this is saying analogous to what happens in the over-rotating case, also for the single center. Because also in that case, we've not been able really to uh, reproduce the over-rotating solutions in the framework of first order equations, and also within the context of the uh, subsequent developments, precisely because the three-dimensional base space is not, is not flat. Now, of course, this is really an open problem, and uh, I would like to hear, love to hear from the audience suggestions. Uh, so, just concluding, uh, I think that uh, the flow equations, that first of all, the flow equations for describing black holes, uh, the normal supersymmetric uh, extreme of black holes have been very successful for zero cosmological constant. As I said, we've had tremendous development, and uh, uh, we now have many, many non GPS multi center solutions uh, for which we can start studying really the physics, start understanding the uh, possible. Uh, uh, possible uh, bounds of domains of stability and uh, the usual split attractors. Everything that has been done essentially for the BPS case now can be done also for the non-BPS case. And the next step would be to try to extend this to ADS. I showed you that we can succeed even though with some difficulty to obtain flow equations for the BPS case in ADS, uh, but it's very difficult to uh, go beyond that case uh, to the multi-center and to the non-BPS case, and I hope that uh, uh, I will, uh, with this talk, I have stimulated at least the attention to the problem and then the progress can be done also in that direction. Thank you. Essentially, you can apply again. What, what you're applying there is essentially the nested Newton argument. You know? So essentially, you can do the same thing here, at least for the uh, asymptotically flat configuration, for sure. And uh, that was actually one of the other motivations why we started looking at this uh, uh, first order flow. Yeah, no, that's uh, actually a good suggestion. Indeed, we thought about it, but we didn't really, uh, we didn't really do it. Uh, well, first of all, because in the beginning we didn't even have uh, an n equals two formulation with the embedding tensor formalism, and recently Bernard, with his student, provided us that uh, formulation. So we should now try and look into that paper and, and, and see how to apply it. I agree.
have only one solution, and uh, it's very difficult to learn lessons, uh, general lessons from only one solution. Yeah, in the end it was the same solution essentially. So it was three groups working on this uh, project, and we found, as I said, uh, different setups, because our solution is uh, not connected, let's say, to the, so the solution I have with uh, Alessandro is not connected to the one by Cacciatore and Clem just by the duality rotation. Uh, you have to do essentially a change of synthetic frame and then a duality rotation anyway. Uh, it's essentially formally the same solution, so we don't really, I cannot say much about that, but, but it's obviously an interesting problem. Uh, here, as I said before, you have actually an additional problem, which is the fact that somehow the, the scalars are already fixed at infinity. Uh, so that is really the, the thing that constrains you. Know? And uh, you, in order to have flat directions, in the Unge case, the flat uh, directions are really flat directions all over along the flow. No? The modules are modulated for the whole for the whole uh, for the whole flow. So beside the hypermultiples, which are moduli, even though in the in the non-BPS case, even the uh, moduli uh, that you have uh, in the no, in the non-BPS case are moduli all along the flow. Now. Here, this would mean that you fix some of the moduli at the value, at the critical points of L, and you have to find now a black hole, which is such that the critical point at the horizon still has those moduli fixed. I mean, it's uh, rather tricky. 